Welcome to the module on optimal sexual function. What we're going to do in this module is really define the issue. It's much more than just erectile dysfunction. Everybody knows about that, but there's a lot of other layers to it and a lot of other factors that go into what causes uh, sexual dysfunction, including erectile dysfunction, and how it can be approached and treatments uh, offered. We're going to talk about in this section the variety of disorders that you see listed on the screen here the hypoactive sexual desire or libido issue, erectile dysfunction, which we all know about, orgasmic disorders, disordered ejaculation, and then failure to uh, lose an erection. That's called detumescence, and that has some fairly significant impact and things that you really need to know about. So first off the bat is uh, decreased libido or hyper, hypoactive desire, and there's a variety of factors in in this interplay of this disorder and basically it comes down to anything you could think of in terms of lifestyle stress poor sleep overworked medication side effects some underlying depression or anxiety obviously issues with relationship and and marital problems or significant other problems factor into this and a huge component of of this and other sexual dysfunction disorders is performance anxiety Trouble with the uh, initial encounter oftentimes leads to anxiety and, and subsequent uh, stage fright or even fear or avoidance of intercourse, which uh, can happen. And there's definitely strategies to mitigate that problem. All right, so erectile dysfunction, you know what this is about, but let's, let's cover it in a little bit more detail because there are some critical pieces of the puzzle that if you know about this, it not only can significantly improve sexual health, but also has the potential to avoid some catastrophic health consequences down the road. So erectile dysfunction is defined as the persistent failure to achieve pressure inside the penis enough to get an ejaculate, enough to get an erection that is hard enough to penetrate the partner. And uh, it also includes uh, being unable to maintain enough pressure throughout the sexual act to reach ejaculation. Uh, maintaining penile pressure is an important part of uh, coming to climax and ejaculating. I'll talk more about that in a separate module. This isn't a medical school course, but by knowing a little bit of the basics about how your plumbing works can really help make some intelligent decision making about supplements, lifestyle factors, and uh, seeking professional help. The causes of erectile dysfunction, mental, we talked in the previous slide about some, some psychiatric and psychosocial stress factors, anxiety, performance anxiety, and whatnot. Vascular, obviously we're talking about blood flow into and out of the penis, and this has a huge impact on ED, which you'll see in a few slides down the road here. Hormonal, previous module we talked about low testosterone and andropause. Neurotransmitters. There is a connection mind-body between the brain and sexual function, obviously, but there are certain neurotransmitters that really need to act on the penile tissue appropriately to generate an effective erection. A variety of chronic diseases, many of them you could think about, uh, diabetes, heart disease, a variety of other uh, chronic health maladies can cause and contribute to erectile dysfunction. And medications. This is a huge list, but it's important to know about some interactions uh, of medications that can cause erectile dysfunction and some strategies about what to do if you're on a particular medication, how to approach or maybe mitigate that uh, issue. And so that'll be covered in a separate section as well. The take-home point in this first section is that diseases of the blood vessels are really the number one cause by far in a way. Vascular insufficiency is basically there's not enough blood supply getting into the penis or it's not being trapped and maintained in there. Maybe there's some problems with the veins where even though the blood flows in enough to get an erection, it can't be held there by the veins and it leaks out and the penis rapidly becomes soft and flaccid. That's the number one cause. The critical point to know about that is at least theorized the canary in the coal mine. There's some controversy about this, but there's plenty of data in my mind that makes sense. And I hope that after listening to this section here, it makes sense to you as well. And so the theory is, if you think about the size of a penile artery in contrast to the heart arteries, and you can see from the picture here, uh, graphic representation, they're obviously significantly different in size. And so if a person is having trouble with blood flow in a small artery in their penis, it goes to argument that there probably is some blockage in the larger arteries of the heart and other blood vessels in the body, like the carotid arteries going to the brain or even the aorta, which perfuses and sends blood throughout the entire body. So size is really a critical factor. And 
there's a complicated uh, uh, topic called vascular biology. And basically, I'm going to boil it down into just a simple sentence. There's a component of inflammation that goes on in the body. The same thing happens inside our blood vessels. This process leads to buildup of all sorts of crap inside the blood vessels, which can plug them up and is seen as erectile dysfunction, heart attack, and stroke. The other component of this process is basically the large blood vessels that arise from the aorta into the groin area provide blood into the genitals. And these larger blood vessels can be plugged up with plaque, cholesterol, and the blood flow thereby is decreased into the penis. Sometimes the, the really tiny blood vessels that are inside the penis are actually obliterated. They're completely wiped out and there's not any blood flowing into the channels that are required for an erection. There's three separate tubes inside the penis that uh, allow uh, arterial blood flow to flow in and venous blood flow to flow out. But when the blood flows in and it's trapped, that's what generates an erection. So the overall result is common sense, decreased rigidity, uh, smaller erections, uh, difficulty maintaining erection. And I also want to point out that diabetes is a huge risk factor for this problem. I have plenty of diabetics that I see in my clinical practice that really aren't terribly mindful of their sugar until it reaches a critical problem. And uh, unfortunately, about half of all diabetics have some degree of erectile dysfunction. And by the age of 60, more than 70% of diabetics have erectile dysfunction. The take home point here is that if a diabetic person has erectile dysfunction, the risk of having a heart attack goes up. The risk of heart disease in diabetics with known erectile dysfunction is 1.4 times higher. So take that to heart. It should be really considered that if a person has diabetes and they also have erectile dysfunction, there probably should be some screening and some other uh, tests and strategies to look at the heart and other blood vessels to prevent catastrophic outcomes such as heart attack, massive heart attack, or unfortunately sudden death. That's about 50% of people who have heart disease. That's the presenting symptom is sudden cardiac death. What about that cigar and smoking? Well, we know that the risk of blocked arteries in the body increases for every 10 pack years of smoking cigarettes. About 80% of people who smoke have abnormal blood flow into the penis. This is done by some specific testing protocols. Nicotine, as I talked about in the Men's Health and the Sleep course, does a variety of things to the body, including stimulating the brain, but it also causes spasm or tightening of the little tiny blood vessels in the fingers. This is well documented on some nuclear med medicine and, and other types of imaging scans, but it also causes the same process inside the very small arteries inside the penis and genitals. Nicotine also increase, I'm sorry, inhibits uh, steroid production, which is testosterone. That has an impact on sexual health, also heart, bone, and brain health. And unfortunately, passive smoke has many of the same negative implications and also impairs sexual function. So take this to heart next time you're thinking about lighting up that next cigar or cigarette or dropping in a dip of chewing tobacco. Moving on to male orgasmic disorder, or MOD. This is defined as the absent or delay of ejaculation when the normal degree of activity that's going on at that point would be anticipated in, in an average person to result in ejaculation. It's really a complex interplay of factors, more than I want to cover in this initial presentation, but certainly some therapies and some strategies to deal with this disorder. Disordered ejaculation, undoubtedly you've heard of some of these, the premature ejaculation, inhibited ejaculation, and ejaculation is complete absence of ejaculation despite appropriate and adequate sexual stimulation and intercourse. Retrograde uh, ejaculation, that's instead of anything coming out of the penis, it all flows backwards uh, into the tubes and sometimes into the bladder. There's a disorder of painful ejaculation, it can be blood in the ejaculation or discolored semen, that's a different topic. Uh, patients also report decreased volume and force. That's another type of disordered ejaculation. And then last is anorgasmia. That's the complete inability to have any sort of orgasm during any type of sexual activity or stimulation. Next, I want to cover failure of detumescence, failure of an erection to go away. This is defined in medical terms as any erection that lasts longer than four hours should be considered a medical emergency. Unfortunately, I've had a few patients in the emergency department that have uh, delayed uh, coming in for care because they were embarrassed. And uh, I know one gentleman who ended up with uh, amputation of his penis because the tissue 
began to die and become gang- gangrenous and had to be uh, removed surgically. Priapism, despite what you know you might have thought during your teenage years or early 20s, uh, it's extremely painful. And although there is a full erection present, no sexual desire is noted during priapism. And this is definitely in a medical emergency. Uh, this course is for educational purposes only, but anybody who's taking erectile aids or using injection therapies or, or medical medications really should be educated that priapism needs to be taken seriously and addressed promptly. Primary means the cause is unknown. Secondary, as I alluded to in the previous slide, this is usually medications or medical conditions underlying problems like sickle cell, etc. So I want to wrap up this, this initial section here and give you a little taste of what's to come. We're going to talk about how it works a little bit more about the physiology, which can allow some biohacking of erectile dysfunction. How we as uh, physicians and healthcare providers uh, can measure the erectile dysfunction. What sort of workups, tests, and labs need to be done? It's more than just a testosterone level. Unfortunately, a, a lot of uh, patients are just left with getting their, their T level checked. And if that's normal, they're just you know put on a medication and sent out the door without any real definite addressing the underlying problems. We'll also talk about drugs, devices, supplements, and some significant lifestyle factors that really can help improve this issue. And the last section, we're going to talk about some really amazing, impressive, emerging therapies that have shown a lot of promise and success. So I hope you join me for the rest of the course.